you wanted the best, you've got the best podcast. The hottest, hottest. podcast in the, world. in the world. The Chris Voss Show, the preeminent podcast with guests so smart you may experience serious brain bleed. Get ready, get ready. Strap yourself in. Keep your hands, arms, and legs inside the vehicle at all times because you're about to go on a monster education roller coaster with your brain. Now, here's your host, Chris Voss. Hi, folks. It's Voss here from the Chris Voss Show.com. The Chris Voss Show.com. Hey, we're coming here with another great podcast. We certainly appreciate you guys tuning in. Holy crap, we've been seeing explosive numbers of subscribers on the podcast. Make sure you invite your family, friends, relatives, get everyone subscribing to the podcast. To grab their phone and say, Are you smarter today? Join the podcast. You will be. Uh, you can see the video version of this uh, interview at youtube.com for slash chris voss hit that bell notification button so you get all the different things you can see all the great authors the brilliant minds we've had on the chris voss show at amazon.com forward slash shop forward slash chris voss we have a list of all the different uh book authors that are up there go ahead and buy them all yeah i mean that's what credit cards are for really just buy um, buy them all you're gonna be smarter and your life's gonna be better just for uh all the things you're gonna learn uh today we have another great author on the show uh he is c james jensen expand the power of your subconscious mind and uh he joins us today jim began his career as a salesman with encyclopedia britannica in his senior year of college, within seven years, he became become an international sales manager in charge of worldwide sales. At the age of 28, he became a senior vice president and CEO of Great Books of the Western World, a division of Encyclopedia Britannica. In the same year, Jim and his wife, Jerry, attended a four-day seminar that would have an incredible impact on their lives forever. As written in the introduction, Jim became both a voracious student and ultimately teacher of many of the principles written in his book, Expand the Power of Your Subconscious Mind. Jim also became president and CEO of two additional companies that each became the leading company within its respective industry. Jim attributes much of the success of those companies to the management and the employees embracing many of the principles taught in this book. Uh, Jim provides executive coaching, consulting, and advisory services to emerging growth and mid-sized companies. He's an active member of the world president's organization, serves as a life director for the Institute of Neon, Neotic Sciences, I think that is, and is a member of the board of directors as well as chairman of the executive committee of the board of Aspen Group Incorporated. Welcome to the show. How are you, Jim? I am great, and thank you very much for that nice introduction. Thank you. What is Neotic science, Sciences? Did I even pronounce that right? I'm sorry. Uh, the Institute of Noetic Sciences. Noetic it was founded by the late uh, astronaut Edgar Mitchell. No Noetic. All right, there you go. I learn something new every day. That's the reason we have these podcasts, yeah. just for me and my audience to learn. And we're going to learn a, a lot of great things to you uh, about you today. Uh, give us the plugs for your book and your website so people can find you. Well, the uh, website uh, is cjamesjensen, all one word, lowercase, dot com. And, uh, or you could Google expand the power expand the power of your subconscious mind, and you would get all the details of the book that one would need. Awesome sauce. So um, what, what motivates you want to write this book? Well, that's a great question, Chris, and it's probably the most important in terms of the answer I provide, because I got off to an early start. Uh, I started selling Britannica when I was 20, my senior year in college. And at 23, became their youngest division manager. At 25, I had the good fortune, my wife and I, to be sent to Sydney, Australia, where I was in charge of sales for all of Australia and New Zealand. And at the age of 27, I was placed in charge of worldwide sales. In that same month, uh, which was January 1969, I was featured in the cover story of Fortune magazine called A Gallery of Business Wonders. And people would always say to me, Jim, what do you attribute to your success? And I would say, well, you know, I'm very enthusiastic. I work hard. I've got great work habits. And, but nothing that would impact or change their lives. And we had a lot of friends from our hometown in Seattle. 
that had gone through a four-day seminar called Omega. And they kept saying, Jim, you've got to go through this seminar. You got to. I said, I'll do that when we get back you know, to the United States. I'm not going to fly from Sydney, Australia to go through a four-day seminar. So we came back to Chicago in January 1969. In October, my wife and I attended this four-day seminar taught by its founder, John Boyle. And for the first time, I understood the principles in the mechanics of performance. I had a toolkit that I could share with others that not only improved their performance in their work, but in relationships, in parenting, teaching, coaching, their personal health, all areas of their life. And I thought, wow. And I went up to the seminar teacher and the owner of the company, John Boyle, and I was only 27 years old and affectionately poked him in the chest and said, John, someday I'm gonna teach your seminar and someday I'm gonna own your company. And he thought, yeah, right, kid, you know. <laughs> and so I continued to embrace the teachings and we included uh, as part of the management perks in the company I was with, the opportunity for any of our managers and their spouses to go attend this four day seminar if they wanted. Uh, we brought the teachings in house. I had two full time ladies that went around to our different locations. And for those that wanted to attend, wasn't mandatory, we would provide this information. And I used to say to John Boyle, the founder of Omega, where did you learn all of this information? And all he said to me is, well, I studied with uh, John, uh, Joseph Murphy. I studied with Joseph Murphy. Well, you know, there was no, I couldn't Google him. There was no internet in 1969. There was no way I could, you know, and I just thought, okay. And it wasn't until 2004, we were living in Santa Fe, New Mexico, one of my salespeople comes into the room. He said, you know, I've heard you speak. I think you like this book. And he put it down on my desk. It was called The Power of Your Subconscious Mind by Dr. Joseph Murphy. And I thought, could this be the same Joseph Murphy? And in fact, it was. And I called the publisher to see if they would be willing to sell me the rights to publish this book. And the, the publisher was in South Carolina somewhere. And he said, Jim, you know, you sound like a nice guy. I'd love to give you this, but you need to know this book is in public domain. And there are currently uh, 20 different publishers of this book. Anybody, Murphy died in 1981, and anybody could slap a title and publish this book. So uh, I thought, well, I'm going to really embrace this. And I became involved. I ultimately did take over uh, the company that John Boyle had created bought it from his wife after John passed. And I taught these seminars, uh, four day seminars for 11 years. And I had three other instructors with me. And it, uh, it just provides the tools of how we behave, how we learn, how we drag along a lot of unnecessary garbage, you know, that people gave us at an early age, well intending parents, teachers, coaches, whatever. And I thought, you know, here is a book that the teachings of this are so important. And so, again, keep in mind that Murphy wrote his book in 1963. Well, that's over 50 years ago. So I have been so influenced by other leaders in this field of consciousness that I thought, let's take and bring this book into the 21st century. Therefore, the name Expand the Power of Your Subconscious Mind. And we have Dr. Murphy's entire text for his book as part one of this book. And then part two is where I come in and provide all of the things that we have learned in this field of study uh, since he wrote his book in 1963. So I thank to the person that takes the time to read it. And I always say that, you know, this is not about me, my ego, nothing. We're, we're, we're exposing the great teachings of Dr. Murphy and those that I have learned from since then. And that's what the book is all about. And I think that people that choose to read it, if they want to grow in any area of their life, it could be in relationships, in, in again, teaching and parenting, their health, whatever. There are lessons in here. There are tools in here that are applicable to everybody. And I just have to say thank you, Dr. Joseph Murphy, for providing the 
the bench work here of which we've been able to build upon. What an astounding life story, man. You, you've you done a lot. Right, that was a long-winded answer, but it's... The yeah. No, that was great. I, you, you, uh, most people don't realize, you know, it used to be when you wanted, you know, you didn't have the internet back in the day. You needed Encyclopedia Britannica. And, uh, you know, that was one of the treasured items you would have in your home. You know, if your parents got you, you know, Encyclopedia Britannica, you know, they get it so you wouldn't grow up like an idiot like me. Uh, <laughs> never heard of an Encyclopedia Britannica. <clears throat> Their listeners have never heard of that. There's some that might not have, uh, but uh, no, it was uh, it was it was it was wonderful to go through too because you could just peruse it. Like some, I think one time I tried to read it from front to back, like all the volumes, and uh, I don't know. I think I got like J or F or something. Wow, that's impressive. Um, yeah, I don't I don't know if I was fully reading it, but I was like you know kind of going through it, trying to I don't know trying to expand my mind clearly i was trying to prepare to go on jeopardy so one thing you talk in the book about is uh self-talk and how important it is and i don't do you want to explain what the subconscious mind is i'm starting to think there's a lot of people in this world that have just just have no idea what the what that baseline is well let me in response to that answer that question uh for the benefit of the listener define clearly the differences between the conscious and the subconscious and if we have time, I may cover the third area of the mind, which is the supraconscious. Mm. But we have been trained, you know, when we get to self-talk, most people are not consciously aware that we talk to ourselves all day long at the rate of 150 to 300 words a minute, over 50,000 thoughts a day. So your listeners now, in addition to listening to what you have to say, what we're sharing with them, are also thinking, what are we going to do tonight? Where are we going to dinner? You know, I got that thing tomorrow. And all this chatter that goes on in our brains. And I think what we don't know or what we're not aware of is that our self-talk is a significant factor in determining who we are, who our future, where our future is, our success, our failures, whatever. And... Uh, the subconscious, most of us are still trained in school today, handles our bodily functions. It grows our hair, our nails, heals a wound, digests our food. What, what typically is not taught is that the subconscious is also a servo mechanism that operates 24-7, carrying out the instructions given to it, by the conscious area of the mind. And it's totally non-judgmental and will work just as hard to achieve a negative instruction as it will a positive instruction. We give an analogy in the book to visualize an ocean liner going across the sea and the captain would be like the conscious area of the mind up in the helm of the ship, barking out signals to the crew, full speed ahead, port starboard, 10 degrees, whatever. And the crew would be like the subconscious down in the hold of the ship, below the water level, can't even see where the ship is going. They simply say, aye, aye, sir, carry out the orders not minding whether they run the ship into the rocks, hit another vessel, or get it safely to its destination. So when we realize we have this incredible, credible servo mechanism that's totally non-biased called the subconscious that's daily carrying out the instructions that we give it. We can be more consciously aware of what are we saying with our own self-talk. So if I say all the time, gosh, I always get so nervous, you know, when I get up in front of a group or I can never remember names. They just say, aye, aye sir, we'll take care of it. We'll make sure that happens. Well, if that's not what I want, then I have to become more, or I could choose to become more aware of what are the things I want to bring about change. And then we change our self-talk to describe, for example, if I were a person that got nervous in front of a group, I might say, you know, I really enjoy speaking to large groups. I have a lot of ease. I, I'm very comfortable with that. And we develop what's called affirmation. And, and affirmations are part of maybe what we can talk about. It's an extremely important part of the book. But we put data input into our mind. The data input can be different than what it has been. And as we begin to change that data input, an image of who we are, who we want to become, the self 
the, the subconscious works 24 seven to bring that into reality. And I've seen it happen in relationships. Uh, I remember I taught this information for 11 years, but in relationships and parenting and teaching in job performance in achieving greater wealth, if that was a goal of somebody, and the principles that Joseph Murphy wrote about in 1963 are just as important and real today as they were when he first put all this down. It's astounding to me how many people don't know about the subconscious mind or that there is a subconscious mind. Like, and they don't, they don't realize it's running 24 seven. It's like, you know, basically running your body, it's running your thoughts. <clears throat> uh, I, I've had people tell me, you know, they, when they have dreams at night, they're like, uh, it's probably, I don't know, some empirical source sending it to you. It's like, no, it's your brain. It's just bored. It's just playing movies and making up stuff. And it, it's incredibly creative too in, in itself. Yeah. But like you say, it's kind of like an R2-D2 sort of robot where uh, if you tell it what to do, it, it listens very closely and goes, oh, yeah, yeah, okay, <laughs> we'll do that. That's what yeah. you want? We'll do that. And a lot of times it can be, antithetical to um, you know what we want to really achieve well and it, it it never goes to sleep our conscious mind does go to sleep mm -hmm. but, but our our data all the things we've learned seen done experienced and the feelings of that are all stored in the subconscious so when we experience something it could be new we say gosh what is this thing that i'm experiencing and we experience it through our senses we hear see feel taste smell, whatever, and then we identify what it is and because we go into our subconscious and say, what is this? Oh, it's a da-da. I got it. Okay. Is this leading me towards something I'm going to enjoy? It's going to make me happy? Or is it something I don't want to be involved in is negative? And then based on that analysis of revealing the content we have in our subconscious mind, we make a decision for either action, inaction, or reaction. So we, again, have this incredible toolkit that still is not taught in the schools. And my goal is to make this information available to as many people in the world as we can. It's already being published in 10 languages other than English and was released by Simon & Schuster last week. And uh, we're, we're very excited about the content here. And again, I acknowledge all the people that I learned from who are incorporated into these teachings this is not about Jim Jensen. I'm the one that <laughs> kind of, you know, put all these pieces together and happy to share it with the world. So in your book, you talk about affirmations. Can you tell us more about what those are and what they're about? Yes. Uh, affirmations are tools that we can use to bring about changes in our life. Most people, uh, if they don't have success with affirmations, is because they just write out Let's say somebody wants to lose weight. And so they write down a statement, uh, I am not overweight, or I don't want to be overweight. And they keep saying that to themselves. Well, that won't bring about any changes because there's three steps that we need to do in the affirmation process. And most people are not aware of steps two and three. So let's say I go to the doctor, I've gained a little weight. He says, uh, gee, Jim, you're 225 pounds. I think you'd be better if you could lose 25 pounds and go down to 200, and by the way, I did this several years ago, that would be great. So I create an, an affirmation in the first person present tense as though it has already happened. So I say, I look good, not I'm going to. I look good and feel good at 125 pounds. So that's the verbal part of the affirmation. The second part is visual. I see myself walking into the office in my new suit. And the employees say, Jim, you look so great, you know, since you've lost all that weight. And then the third part that records in the subconscious are the feelings associated with the affirmation. Then I just, I feel so good. So again, I look good and feel good at 125 pounds. Now, I might develop a support affirmation that says I eat only enough food to maintain my perfect weight of 200 pounds. And, but affirmations that we teach all of this in the book, it's all there. So you create a goal of what you want. You develop a statement 
first person present tense as though you have already achieved it. You create visualization that supports what that will look like when you've achieved it. And then you feel good internally having achieved that. All of those elements come into play and causes the subconscious then, again, to say, got it, boss. Remember on the crew? Uh, the, got it, boss. We'll take care of it. You know, we'll go to work on it. And it's just fascinating how well it works. I, one of the things I've always loved about the subconscious mind is, like, when you're trying to solve a problem. And, and like, sometimes I can, like, in business or something, I would, I would be like, man, I don't know how to solve this problem. And a lot of times I'd think about it, and i go to bed. And you wake up, and your subconscious mind would go, here you go. We yeah. thought about that while you were asleep and figured out your problem. So uh, this sounds like it works for you. Well, let me also, if I may, just to talk, talk briefly on the third area of the mind, which is not taught in our school today, mm -hmm. which is called the supra, not super, supra, S-U-P-R-A, supraconscious. And the supraconscious has access to all knowledge in the universe, not just that that's stored in our subconscious, through either our reading experiences or whatever. And it is phenomenal for creative problem solving. Now, most of the problems that we would want to solve, I mean, the first step is identify the problem, what is it? And we consciously try to solve it and we solve it. Now, when we get to a point where we find ourselves repeating possible solutions that don't solve our problem and we're kind of spinning our wheels, is when we say, okay, I'm gonna turn this over to the supraconscious. Because the supraconscious has knowledge to all information access in the world. So the way that we turn it over, we've already gone through steps one, two, and three to find the problem or the potential solutions. We tried to solve it, we have in step four. I turn it over to the superconscious by saying, superconscious, a name, would you please take this problem? And by the way, if I need a date, and I need a response, please, by next Friday. We turn it over to the superconscious, trusting that the superconscious will provide that for us. And then five, very important, get busy doing something else. Don't take the problem back. And I'll tell you one story uh, uh, in a company that I was CEO of. We were at the marketing level struggling with a solution to something. And on a Friday, I grabbed our group together. There were probably six to eight of us but all of our executive team. And I said, you know, I don't know why we're struggling with this, but nobody, including myself, has come up with a creative solution. I would like all each of you to please turn this over to your superconscious. And they were aware of that because we had been teaching that within the, and on Monday morning at nine o'clock, we're gonna regroup and let's get the perfect solution. So we regroup at nine o'clock Monday morning. And I said, okay, what's the solution to our marketing problem. And our little lady who was our corporate secretary, Kathy Hornsby, who was from England and couldn't spell marketing, but she says, you know, Jim, uh, gosh, I was working in the garden yesterday and this thought came to me. Is there any reason that we couldn't A, B, C, D? And all the marketing geniuses looked at each other, including myself, like, what the hell, where did that come from? And she gave us the perfect solution which would come from the superconscious. Now here's an experience that every one of your listeners have had. Let's say we normally get up at six o'clock in the morning. We got a early morning flight tomorrow. Very important, we need to get up at four o'clock and we set our alarm for four. We call the friend we're traveling with, say, gosh, would you please call me at four o'clock? I need to be awoken. And we've got so important, so important that I wake up for it, so important. Okay, we go to sleep. We don't go to sleep necessarily earlier. We might be later because we're doing last minute packing, so on and so forth. We're in a dead sleep, the room's totally black. Boop. We wake up with a start, no noise. We look over at the clock and it's at 3.59, just going to four. And then zzz, the alarm goes off, zzz, the phone rings, but we were already awake. Who woke us? The supra conscious. That's one of the, and there's probably not one listener at some time that hasn't had that experience in their life. But mm -hmm. now that we know that it's part of us, but we go into detail, taking the reader through the understanding in much more depth of what the superconscious is, how to use it. It's just a phenomenal tool. And, uh, but again, so far these things have not been taught predominantly in our schools. 
Awesome sauce. Awesome sauce. It's, yeah, it's, it's, it is amazing that they don't teach this. Fortunately, I had my father's books, and he may have had this book in his library when I was a kid. Uh, he had a lot of different subconscious mind and, you know, the W. Clement Stone, Think You're Grow Rich, and all that stuff in his libraries. And so I'd been digging through it and reading through it. Um, so why is visualization so important to bring about the desired result? Why does it make such a huge difference in, in thinking about it and visualizing and making the pictures? Well, because the pictures record in the subconscious area of our mind. So we want to have a picture. What does this look like? So that when I do my affirmation, I can see, oh, yeah, this is what it'll be like. This will be great. This is what I'm doing. This is where I'm going. So visualization is just a very important component of our entire learning and performance process. And again, I'm only repeating what had been proven by the experts in this field of study. And I didn't create this. But visualization is, I mean, we've all had experiences. You have, your listeners have had experiences where they visualized a new house they wanted to buy, what it looked like, you know, the couple would sit down and how many bedrooms, you know, where is it? Does it have a view? And they visualize it over and over and over. Now, if you share that vision with the realtor that's helping you, that helps too. But all of a sudden, boom, something comes. We say, gosh, this is incredible. This is exactly what I have been visualizing. And without that, oh, it's just a house. It's just too bad. You know, and it, it, we waste a lot of time without really making crystal clear a vision of what the end result of that request really looks like. Nice. Uh, that makes all the difference in the world. Um, so what were some modern enlightened thinkers that you most admired that inspired you? I'm sorry, you cut out what? Uh, what were some uh, modern enlightened thinkers that you most admire, maybe that inspired you the most? Oh, I mean, there are so many. I mean, Peter Drucker, the effective executive. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I enjoyed his work. Uh, uh, Bruce Lipton, uh, Dean Radin, who was in charge of uh, psychology and all the science for the Institute of Noetic Sciences, of which I served on their board for 11 years. I'm now a life director. His, his teachings are brilliant. And I am a constant reader, constant learner, as opposed to perceiving myself as being learned. And, and uh, there's just new data coming to us all the time. And uh, I love myself unconditionally, just the way I am, because the only time there is, is now. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people waste a lot of their conscious time by dwelling on something that happened in the past, that they have regret and they feel bad, you know, and then they, or they worrying about something in the future. But if you draw a timeline, you say, this is the past, this is now, and this is the future. And then I say, okay, is this now? And they say, I say to them, is that, yeah, that, that, not? no, no, it's not. This is now because it's constantly moving. So there is no future. There's only the possibility of future nows. So narrowing that span and not wasting a lot of our thinking time, lamenting over something that may have happened in the past or worrying about something that may or may not happen in the future is a waste of time. So we want to become present and bring everything as much as we can, you know. Uh, and, and, you know, the more that we have, we were blessed that my wife and I went through this training uh, three years before we had our first child. And the fact that I became a teacher in this information was constantly learning it from the experts who created it. Our children were blessed uh, by having all of this. The way that we raised them was the way that I'm talking about right now. And, and they are so uh, well-rounded in their achievement in their work, but in their relationship with each other, with their kids, uh, just everything that they do. And it's, it's, it's inspiring to both my wife and I to see that. Thank you again, Joseph Murphy. There you go. Uh, Dr. Lee Poulos, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that correctly, wrote the foreword to your book. Uh, what's your relationship to him? Well, Lee Poulos is... One of my closest friends, he's now 93, living in Vancouver, B.C., where he was raised. He's a dual citizen, got his Ph.D. from UCLA um, in both psychology and philosophy. And Lee uh, 
I met at a seminar that he taught on self-hypnosis and the ability through hypnosis to also help achieve goals. It's just another tool that we can use. And uh, in 1969, I was the educational chairman for the young presidents, excuse me, it was, 19, it was 1971, for the Young Presidents International Conference in Madrid, Spain. And I brought Lee because we had, uh, most of the content for the presidents organization are, is business content. Because the, uh, the statement that describes YPO is to make better presidents through education and idea exchange. But we had a, something because I'd been exposed to it. So we had a uh, part of the seminar, which we called extended human capacities. And I brought Uri Geller, the Israeli psychic from Israel to our seminar and people's keys were curling up in their pocket to the room and all kinds of other things. But Lee with his PhD and his studies of some of these extended capacities that we have was able to really articulate to this well-educated group of people these other things that we can develop in our lives. And he and I have been, and he was one of the four teachers when I, I took over the Omega Seminar. He was one of the four of us that taught this seminar for over 10 years. So we're very good friends. I subsequently uh, went to Brazil with him in 1972, uh, two different two-week trips and was exposed to a lot of different teachings. He's just a wonderful, wonderful person. And he wrote the foreword to the book. Awesome. Sounds awesome. Now, if a company was to use the tools that you offer and teachings in the books, how would it be different than, uh, you know, what a lot of old school models are for businesses? How would it be different than what? Excuse me. Uh, old school models for businesses? Okay. Well, uh, in the next book I'm writing, uh, I'm writing a book on enlightened leadership, lessons learned along the way. And I think what's evolving, Chris, is that in, let's call them new age companies, there's more of a shift of empowering the employees to be part of the solution, part of the growth, part of the success. The old model was top down. I'm the boss, do it my way or the highway, period. And it was kind of an outgrowth. If you go back to the <clears throat> beginning of the previous century, you know, 80% of our male workforce were farmers. They were drafted to go into the uh, World War I. And in the military, it's got to be a top-down model. You can't sit around and debate and have a discussion. <laughs> and under enemy Should fire. we go up the hill or not? So, so their first experience or uh, what in, to kind of any organization was through the military that they experienced. And that has evolved over time as people have become more <clears throat> articulate, discovering more of their own. And by the way, of leaders wanting to engage the creativity of all of the employees. So today an enlightened workplace or organization of any kind is not a top down. It used to be, uh, you know, it, it, the goal becomes to make better people out of our employees, not just better employees out of our people. So it deals with the whole brand within the organization grows together as a group, not just the empowerment of some strong person at the top. Yeah, definitely makes a difference. So with people, um, it with different management styles that people have, will it, will it make a difference in, in using the technology you have in the book? It, may not make a difference <clears throat> to the success of the company, mm -hmm. but it can make a difference to the success of the employees if as being part of an employee in that company, they're given the opportunity to learn through internal teachings of people uh, the things that I'm talking about. Because in the companies that I've worked in, the feedback that we've had post my in time there, we have anniversaries so often, is sharing the personal experiences they've had as it relates to help or something related to one of the children that had an incredible success because of something the parent learned in our company that they would not have otherwise have known. So it really just expands and it makes people just 
so passionately want to work in that environment. It's no longer just a J-O-B, but it's a place of togetherness. Uh, the people are all learning the same things together. And yes, whatever the product or the service is that the company is providing is critically important to make that extremely uh, successful and produce a lot of revenue for the company. There you go. I mean, we've talked about that a lot of different times on the Chris Voss show, uh, increasing productivity of employees and making them happier, making them more self-fulfilled in their life uh, can make all the difference. Uh, how, how does one people use the technology you have in the book to get rid of old uh, rules or biases or old belief systems that, that are you know self-limiting them? Well, the last chapter in the book is called Moving On an imitation to the path of enlightenment. And I once asked a very good friend, Michael Murphy, who was the founder of Esalen Institute, enlightenment, I always hear about this, what does it really mean? You know, is it going out and sitting on top of some mountain and, you know, meditating with a bunch of gurus? Or you? And he said, well, to most of us, we've been trained that growth is always a process of addition. Therefore, here, we want to really be up here, once we get up here, we really want to be here. So it's always a process of adding more to. But we have to realize that we are already perfect just the way we are. Mm. We don't see that perfection, and we're always seeking to add new information. Enlightenment is when somebody comes to this realization, as I did, thank you to uh, Michael Murphy and also Tim Galway, who wrote The Inner Game of Tennis, that real growth becomes a process of taking away old data that no longer serves us well. And what's the data input that we got as small children? And watch out for these kinds of people. You know how they are. Hey, don't ever do this. This is bad. This is right. You know, all that early data input, if we haven't taken the steps to get rid of it, is still with us and interferes with our ability to become more that which we are. So we end the book by saying, visualize a tugboat going through the water, pulling a big barge of garbage. And all the energy that's required for that tugboat to pull this big barge of garbage. In this particular case, all we have to do is walk to the back of the tugboat and just cut the line between the tugboat and the barge, and it frees up all that free flowing energy that the tugboat moves effortlessly through the water. So to the extent, if we identify there are old beliefs, prejudices, views about things that we're still carrying around with us, is it time to say, why am I still doing this? Do I really want to do this? Do I want to let go of this? And if so, how do we do it? And the book provides the tools on how to do that. And it's very, very, very truly enlightening to give up some of these things that no longer serve as well. There you go. Some people go out and kill themselves in support of some outdated belief that has no relevance at all to the time in which we live today. It's just ridiculous. And it's interesting how the subconscious mind will sit and focus on those things that drive you crazy and the things that, you know, the, like you say, the garbage yeah. that you don't need in your mind. Well, we can say the things that we used to think, and we mm -hmm. have to change our self talk. Yeah. And this used to drive me crazy. But I've made it <laughs> there you go. <laughs> this is no longer worth driving myself crazy. Mm -hmm. So I can create another affirmation I used to. However, today I see the truth and the reality that this is really how I want to live my life. And we choose new language that eliminates the old image that we put into the present subconscious area of our mind. And through this process of repetition, which is the uh, affirmation process that we talked about. We just changed that data. No law, no, no different than going into a computer and saying that software is outdated. We need to change it. Mm -hmm. if we don't change it. The computer will continue to operate the same way. Hey, that's BS. That's old stuff. So how do we do it? Well, we simply input new data that makes that old data no longer relevant. And we can, that's the way our minds work. And I think the, the computer and the data input is just such a great analogy so mm -hmm. many people can relate to because we're all, you know, carrying around these little tools that are just so phenomenal. And, uh, and the, the most important one is the one sitting on top of our shoulders, <laughs> our head. And, 
And what's interesting, it's the one people discount the most. Like they don't, they don't really pay attention to what's going on with themselves and how they're doing it. Um, what's the one thing you hope your readers uh, walk away from after reading your book? Well, I think uh, that's a good question. I would hope they would have a higher sense of their own self-worth and value and, you know, say, gosh, I'm reading this. I really am good at this. And I can see where some of these outdated beliefs, prejudices, opinions, views about things in certain, certain areas could be or could have impacted my effectiveness as a mate, as a parent, as an employee. And I've identified five things that no longer serve me well that I can tell have still been dominant things in my past, because that's where I want to leave them, in the barge with all the garbage. And I'm going to use the tools in this book to drop those and, and just say thank you, you know, for giving me those when I apparently needed them, but I no longer do. And I'm going to pass these along to anybody else that wants them. Great. But I now am going to see it this way instead of that way. I'm going to become this instead of that. I'm no longer an impatient parent. I'm a loving, patient, and giving parent. Mm. And my children are no longer going to have to put up with my impatience when I get so frustrated or mad when they make a mistake, a simple mistake, or do something, you know, wrong. And I always say, you know, about mistakes, it's just a mistake. And one of the funniest parts of movies, which we've all seen, is those movies which have outtakes at the end of the movies where the mm -hmm. leading actors, you know, made incredible flubs during the creation of the movie. And who laughs the hardest when they see these? The, the actors themselves. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's just ridiculous, you know. And, and so it was just a mistake. Sometimes some people allow mistakes. They carry them around for the rest of their life and just beat the hell out of themselves over something that they don't need to do. So I think that's, uh, again, uh, I, I want to emphasize, I am not the creator of this material. I think I've been a very good student and hopefully been able to pass it along to others. And, and I know that I have. And now we put this together in a book that truly brought Dr. Murphy's book, originally written in 1963, into the 21st century. That's awesome. That's awesome. So uh, as we round up the show, give us your plugs again, Jim, so that people can find you on the interwebs and where to order the book. I'm sorry, what? Uh, give me your plugs, uh, your website, where people can order the book from you and uh, order it. Well, they can order the book on online through Amazon, through Simon & Schuster. Uh, but again, if they go to uh, the title, Expand the Power, uh, I think .com, Expand the Power of Your Subconscious Mind, and the uh, my website, www.cjamesjensen, one word, all lowercase, J-E-N-S-E-N, cjamesjensen.com. They'll find all the information that we have been able to produce about the book for viewers that want to see if this is something they would like to order. And for those that want to, there's even a button to push to order the book themselves. There you go. Hit the button and away you go. And you can find more about yourself on there. Uh, we've been talking with C. James Jensen from this book, Expand the Power of Your Subconscious Mind. You can order up on Amazon or wherever books are sold, or you can go to his individual website and check that out. I appreciate my audience for tuning in. Uh, be sure to give us a like, subscribe to us on youtube.com for us. Uh, Chris Voss, you can see the video version of this. You can also go to our other uh, website, the chrisvossshow.com or the cvpn.com, Chris Voss Podcast Network, and uh, refer you to the show to uh, all the nine podcasts that we have on there. You can hit that subscribe button, check that out. Uh, we certainly appreciate my audience for tuning in. Thanks to Jim for being here, and we'll see you guys next time.